everyone, this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. It's my passion to share stories of amazing legal ladies who are working as in-house legal counsel, who have law firm roles, who are leading on boards and who are doing law differently. From time to time, I will also invite special guests on the show to share their insights on legal recruiting and tips for getting hired as a successful lawyer in Japan. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lawyer On Air podcast. In this podcast episode, I share with you another diverse story of a woman lawyer working in Japan. I'm Catherine, the host of the show, and I'm a lawyer based in Tokyo for more than 20 years. I love helping unlock the wisdom of the stories that women lawyers never tell. What I've learned in my career in law so far is have courage. Always encourage yourself, whether it be to take the bar or set up your own law practice, or whenever you have to do what's right. Those are the words of Kaori Oka, who is my guest today on the Lawyer On Air podcast. From the early days of wanting to be a diplomat, but ending up becoming a lawyer, Kaori Oka is now the diplomatic founder of Oka Fortuna Law, a law firm based in Tokyo. Kaori graduated from Tokyo University with an LLB and started her career in 2006 at Bingham McCutcheon LLP Law Office. And then she moved to Iwata Gordo in 2010, pushing forward a mission to build an international practice. As part of that, Kaori took the lead in her own career to prompt secondments first to HKIAC, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, and then to two US law firms. Prior to setting up her own law firm in July 2023, Kaori was at Deloitte Legal. As a solo law practice owner in Tokyo, she is devoting her passion to help foreign clients succeed in their business in Japan. Her independence from the corporate world has also been pivotal in gaining an outside board role as supervisory board member at a Japanese corporation. I loved the synergies we had in this conversation, and these will be very obvious as you listen. On this episode, Kaori shares how taking the bull by the horns with her own career was super critical. Researching, asking, and building a business case to get secondments is what she did, and you can learn how she did that in our conversation. You'll also hear Kaori's advice to build networks and not burn bridges along the way of your career path as people you have met always come back round on your path and can be really necessary as a connection for your future steps. And Kaori also shares her two favorite sayings that guide her, something that you don't know about her and what she's most looking forward to in 2024. Let's get into it. Hello Kaori and welcome to the show. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to your salon. Oh, my salon. Yes. It's super yeah. excited to have you here. And hopefully we will do this soon. But if we're going to meet up in person, uh, where would we be? Do you have a favorite wine bar or restaurant that you love to go to? And what would you choose as your beverage from the menu today? Well, actually, Catherine, that's a difficult question to ask to a person who is living in Tokyo. There are so many good restaurants <laughs> around here. But this time, I will invite you to Lunuga, a cozy bistro I found last year in Ginza near the Kabukiza or other famous theaters. I love the warm and homey atmosphere there, and they do serve the good old traditional French dish like duck confit and papillettes, but my favorite is the cassoulet. So let us order this with a bottle of bold red wine like Morgan. 
bold it's red. Yes. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. And I love that word cozy. Cozy yeah. is such a good word. I can already get the feeling of just mm -hmm. sinking into the seats and ordering very casually and leaving it up to you and, and enjoying <laughs> the wine. It sounds really, really amazing. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And a perfect you know, time of year, if it's winter getting into spring, it sounds like mm -hmm. it would be a really great place to go. Thank yes. you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, let's dive into your career and just a little bit further back from there. When you think about way back when you were a child or maybe as a young adult, do you remember what kinds of things you were dreaming about for your future then? Well, I, I actually grew up in California, Santa Monica from the age two to seven or eight. So I actually experienced a little bit of difficulty to fit into the Japanese society when I came back to Japan. So I wanted to serve as a bridge between the Japan and the U.S. or between the Japan and the world. I didn't have any concrete image what occupation that would exactly be, but I knew by instinct that there need help for especially children who can easily be confused by, you know, moving from one culture to another totally different culture. There's always a knowledge gap between adults and children um, regarding the outside world. The children often think that, you know, this, the society they belong to is the only one world, but it's actually is not, but the children will suffer from the lack of those kind of explanations. So I wanted to serve as a person who can, you know, provide to people who are suffering from that kind of lack of explanation. Wow. Okay. So is that what encouraged you to go and do law then? Because that's a really great way of helping people manage differences. Is that what happened? Well, actually, no. Um, <laughs> lawyers never, never crossed my mind. Wow, there you go. So what took you then, because you did go to university, Tokyo University, and do law. Yes. What mm -hmm. led you then to studying law? Well, I actually wanted to become a diplomat at that time, and that was the reason I, I entered the Tokyo University of the Legal Department. So mm -hmm. I really started hard to become a di diplomat, the bridge between the Japan and the world. Yes, that's your bridge. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, and I took the general knowledge exam and the mm. essay exam in June, received a passing notification in July, and followed by a notice to come for a final interview at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to become a diplomat. You know, I was almost skipping to make that interview at the ministry, but, you know, at that final interview, I totally made a mess. Oh, what happened? Yes, I'm not still not so sure what has irritated the interviewer so much. Ooh. But to me, I felt the questions were rather rude. And, you know, to make matters worse, I was not so much experienced in the ways of the world. So as I should be to just parry those questions and adding some wit um, to my responses. But <laughs> adding wit. Okay. Yes, adding wit. But... Um, it was one um, gentleman, shall I say, who was making the uh, rather rude kind of questions. And I right. really didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I remember doing an interview and coming out and thinking, no, I don't want to do that, even though I thought I did. Is that where you were landing then after that interview? You didn't really want to be a diplomat? Did it turn you off or what happened next? You made the right answer. It really tuned me off. Mm. And the entire atmosphere was telling me that, no, I'm not going to make this interview. And also my passion was really declining at that time. Mm. But it was really interesting that, you know, the interview himself has subtly changed the subject at that time. And he told me that uh, he thought that I would more fit to a lawyer. <laughs> That's that interesting? interesting. Yes, it, it is. It is interesting. I wonder why that person thought that. You know, I'm not so sure about that because I'm not him, but, and it certainly was not a good news for me at that time because I wanted to become a diplomat, not a lawyer. But <laughs> right. it, it, yes, it was that first time I really started thinking what a lawyer would be like. Right. So what did that process, though, teach you about interviews or teach you about the way to approach things with your mindset? I guess you were 
a little bit fixed perhaps on being a diplomat and then mm -hmm. someone pops this idea up whether they're right or wrong and you start to maybe think a little bit differently. Yes. So I started thinking, you know, or studying what the lawyer would be like. And I found that diplomats and lawyers are not that different. You know, diplomats really conduct the international relation itself. But the lawyers have another particular goal set by the clients. And the lawyer's role is to guide them, to guide the clients to achieve that goal by negotiating sometimes international agreements or alliance and using the law just as a tool. So I, I also found out that I can make use of my linguistic skills even as a lawyer or more better to the clients because I thought that I can use my skills regarding the human relationships. You know, I love to connect with people. I love to connect with different culture. I thought that I can make use of those kind of skills as well by being a lawyer. Right. So it was, yes, it was not that difficult for me to change um, my mind from becoming a diplomat to a lawyer. Yeah. And I guess it also depends on what your image is of a lawyer as exactly. you start out, right? And if you've watched a lot of TV programs or you have this impression of lawyers as being very aggressive or argumentative, standing up in court and, you know, fists punching and being <laughs> like that, then it's totally removed from the idea of diplomat. Exactly. But I believe what you're saying sounds to me like you can be a diplomatic lawyer. Exactly. That's the right way. Yes. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> right. And maybe we're going to call this episode The Diplomatic Lawyer because I think that's where it came from. You know, I'm really going to tell you, I wanted to be a diplomat when I was younger as well. And then several so? things happen. I can tell you over dinner when we have a big <laughs> bottle of red wine, but it hadn't turned out. But I believe you can be a diplomatic, diplomatic lawyer. lawyer. The way yes. that you do your law is, is mm -hmm. really important. The way that you help your clients, like you said, thinking about society and culture and using your linguistics. I love it. I love it. Love it. Well, you did go to university at Tokyo University and you got mm -hmm. your LLB and you started out in a law firm in Tokyo. Tell us yes. about how that was. Was it different to what you thought law would be when you started out there? Um, not really. I thought it was quite close to the image that I I had when I joined a mid-size um, you know, law firm in Tokyo. I knew that I had to work hard, but the only um, difference or the only knowledge that I was really shocked to know was that the, the management told me that I am not paid to study at the law firm. So the clients, that means that the clients are looking at you to receive legal advice as a professional. So everything I had to do is was the on-the-job training. If your knowledge is insufficient as a professional, then you have to study after or before the work. So that was kind of um, a gap that I didn't know uh, before I joined the law firm. But besides that, there was not much difference. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the work that we do in law firms is actually on the job. So you're mm -hmm. studying exactly. and there are times you do have to go to the bookshelf or onto the internet and find out things by research. I exactly. suppose maybe mm -hmm. they meant, you know, that you you don't charge the client for your study time, but oh, yes, they're exactly. actually absolutely mm -hmm. saying do it at, in your own time, which is mm -hmm. an interesting approach. Maybe things have changed a little bit more these days, but you did kind of M&A and other kinds of cases there. Were there any things there that were really impactful for you to then help you further on in your career? Yes, there are lots of cases that were really interesting for me. But if I pick up one case, it was absolutely a antitrust case that the client was imposed of a huge amount of administrative charges in the US, in Europe, and also in Asia, including Japan. So we set up a team, global team, in the US, in Europe, and in Japan, and in Asia. Regarding the time difference, it was so hard for us to just catch up what was talked in the Western side and, you know, pull the, all the 
um, required information that we need to um, prepare a document in the Asia side. And it was like working like 24 hours all day. The case was really interesting, but also it was really, really tough. Yeah, it seems that Japan-based people are the ones that default to everybody else's time zone. It's quite hard doing that kind of work. Exactly. You've really got to be so focused on being on the clock for a very long hours for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And then you moved firms after that to a more, I guess, domestic firm. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Yes, um, I left the first firm because actually my monthly billing hours were exceeding 320 hours Ooh. and you, 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 you know you just get exhausted that is and, a lot yep that is a yes. lot yes yes yeah. and many junior associates were beginning to leave the firm because of the hard work but mm. um i didn't like the management that it seems to me that they weren't paying much attention to that trend of the junior associates not digging into the reason beneath that why the junior associates were leaving like that that's yes. important isn't it to know why people are falling away um, and not retaining them that's a really mm -hmm. critical thing i think it would be extremely important for people to be looking at now so that impacted you did it yes it really impacted me and that made me feel that when I become a management of a law firm, I will never leave this situation like this. <laughs> wow, that's really impactful because I'm mm -hmm. sure that's helping you now because we will get there shortly, but you are running your own practice now. And exactly. I think all, this, exactly. all these learnings <laughs> really form into what you do and how you live your life when you run your own practice. But mm -hmm. you joined this domestic firm, but they had still an international practice, I believe. Yes, exactly. When I had an interview with the second firm, they told me that they were now investing in the international practice uh, because the frequency of the difficulties experienced by their Japanese clients were increasingly growing. And right. thus it was a yes, it was a pressing issue for them at that time to you know build a dynamic team with experienced lawyers who can play in the international field. And I thought that yes. This must be a perfect fit for me. Right. So what happened there that was really interesting? I think you had some secondments and other things that came up for you, which were really great experiences. Can you tell us about that? Because maybe some people think that with a domestic firm in Japan, you may not have those opportunities. But I really think it's great for you to share that those opportunities can come up uh, within a domestic firm as well. Yes, yeah, Sure. If there are junior associates who think that domestic um, law firms will not allow them to make second amendment internationally, then um, I, I will say that it should be you who will prepare for the second amendment and just propose it to the management. If the management is serious, they will certainly find you the way to go through it. Is because that what that you was, did? Yes, that yeah. was how I did it. Great. How did you know to do that? Why did you know to do that? That's like doing it is one thing, but knowing to do it and knowing it's okay to do it is another thing. Where, how did that come up for you? I will say that, you know, keeping the eyes on, you know, international news that you are interested in or keep good companies who are familiar with those kind of international um, movement, that will be the starting point that will give you the information that you would like to have. Like the HKIAC, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, that I really didn't know that there is such a kind of organization at Hong Kong. But when I was um, engaged in some kind of international arbitration project, then suddenly a friend of mine told me that, you know what SIAC is, there's the Sing Singapore International Arbitration Center. And then when I check those the internet or the website of the IAC, they say that they always welcome the trainings or the you know exchanging visitors um, between the law firms and the organization. So I thought that okay, I think I can take the opportunity to just you know go to the international arbitration center. Maybe it doesn't have to be at Singapore; it can be the Hong Kong, or it can also be the, you know, the London, or it can also be the ICC. So it's it's always important to just open the network of your network and receive 
the information, the update information, then there will be a chance. Absolutely, there will be a chance. You're so right. It's just you are taking possession of your career. You're not waiting for someone else to exactly Catherine. be in charge, right? And so you've gone online, you've found the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, and you've spotted that they welcome visitors, that they welcome trainees. Mm -hmm. And you've connected the dots and then said, hey, you know, this is going to be great for my practice and arbitration, I'd love mm -hmm. to go and do a little secondment there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's brilliant. That is so yes. brilliant. You are in charge of your career, so go exactly, for it. Exactly, exactly. And it's interesting that once you speak out loud, it's very interesting that someone in the firm or someone close to the firm really has further information regarding the the career that you're spotting at, like the HKIAC, it was amazing to get to know that a partner at my firm really knew somebody at the HKIAC. And there was no difficulty to being seconded to the HKIAC from that time. There you go. You know, if you've never said anything and kept it to yourself, what would have happened, right? You really found Mm -hmm. that there was an opportunity because someone could then just introduce you. Hey, we've got this associate. I think you're an yes. associate at that time who wants to come through. How long can you take her for? Is it possible? And so what did you do? You went there for a little while and then what happened? Before going to Hong Kong, I thought that it would be nice to just pick up a law firm in the U.S. so that I can move from Hong Kong to, to the United States to see the legal practice in the U.S., it will be you know, a little bit redundant to go to Hong Kong and come back to Japan and find another opportunity to come when to find a um, you know another law firm in the U.S. I thought that it would it should be done at one time. So right, like if, a sort of yes. package. You wanted to it's, try and do exactly. your, next, your next move as well. So how did you go about that? And it seems like looking at your a bio and your that you mm -hmm. sent through to me that you actually did and you know managed to do that. So tell us how you did that. Yes. So there was a one big case at that time that I was engaged in and that was related to Japan and also the US. So working on that project, of course I get to know to the lawyers in the United States and of course become connected with um uh, several law firms. So I just, you know, contacted the law firm that I wanted to go and I asked them if there is any chance for me to just work at your firm. It's, it doesn't have to be a fixed employment agreement. It can be just an exchange of visitors so that I can see the reality of the U.S. practice. Most of the law firms were really responded favorably to me. And I, I picked up two um, law firms from that. Just again, I um, proposed to the management and said that, you know, hey, I, I already received a favorable you know, reply from two law firms. I really want to um, see how what's going on in the U.S. And can I just go from the Hong Kong to the United States to just, you know, for like another uh, one and a half year? Wow. Right. There you go again. You're just claiming your career and mm -hmm. you've proposed and they said, yes, why not? So just before I was leaving the U.S., I was preparing actually my plans to travel to La Paz, Bolivia, but Ooh. I was also thinking whether I should, you know, stay in the same law firm in Japan or shall I just move to another law firm? Because I have so many interests. I'm curious about the movements in the world. I read an article reporting that the big four accounting firms were, you know, ramping up their legal services globally. And the article read that now the big four accounting firms were not just mere accounting firms. They have strategically transformed themselves to a you know, globally integrated business solution providers. So now they have the function of not only accounting, they also have the you know, financial advisory, consulting, tax, and the final piece was a law. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They did, did a lot and really disrupted uh, a lot of the legal community at that time. Exactly. And I know you joined one of those big four. So before you joined there and before you went to the States, you had actually become a partner of that domestic mm -hmm. firm, yeah? Exactly. Then exactly. you went overseas and came back and you you joined one of the big four. Exactly. Wow. And so was that at the time when you they were just kicking off this integrated solutions provider 
network and you were part of the, the legal team that was established at that time? To be honest, there were only five or six lawyers at that time in Deloitte Legal Tokyo. It was so small and I didn't even you know believe that this is an office of a big four because it was so small. But at the same time, I really felt interesting to you know expand the business of the legal and make presence to the Deloitte management team globally and throughout the industry. And you were there right through then until you started your own law firm? Exactly. Wow. What sorts of things came up for you there? Because sometimes, you know, a career perhaps in law and at a, a company or an organization such as that one, uh, maybe it's not always smooth and does come with some twists and turns and bumps. Would you like to share any challenge that you overcame during that time? Well, I really enjoy the days in Deloitte. I can see in the eyes of clients that they were satisfied to receive not only the legal knowledge, but also, you know, the the analysis from the tax side or the business side. And they they really trusted us. That was the very good thing that I, you know, I learned when I was in Deloitte. But in the last three years, I believe, I began to receive offers from Japanese firms to become an independent board director or the you know, supervisory board director. And it was very fortunate for me to receive those kind of offers. But being part of Deloitte, I had to think not only the existing legal conflict of interests within mm. the Deloitte legal, I had to think also the business conflicts, and it was not only the existing ones. It was There were also the intrinsic conflicts that the other member um, groups will have. For example, if one partner of, say, like the financial advisory service asserted that he and his team were approaching to a client and they were making contacts, they were proposing some kind of schemes, then at that time, even I receive an offer from that client, Deloitte will say that, no, there's an intrinsic, you know, conflict of interests between the FA and the legal. So I should not accept those kind of offers. Absolutely. You you know, yeah. you, you got to really scrutinize those conflicts lists that get shared around the the organization to make exactly. sure there's no conflict. Exactly. And I think you've hit on a point there that it actually is very hard for someone who is in a law firm or someone who is in an organization such as Deloitte's, uh, a comprehensive advisor, to actually then be on a board. Exactly. Not, it's very hard to show that you're independent and that you're not having some sort of conflict with one or other of the, the clients or potential clients. So I think that's an important thing that you've hit there. And I think that's also sounding to me like a driver for you to establish your own practice because then you get independence. Yes, exactly. You yeah. Know, yes. And I think that's also another key point and that I'd be able to attest to that as well is that having that independence from a law firm, from perhaps a sole company as well, allows you to have that uh, lack of conflict of interest so that you can go further forward and do the things that you want to do. That's very interesting. Yes, yes. You can control everything by a solo entrepreneur. You don't have any conflicts because, of course, you don't have it as a solo. And you can just connect with the clients that really motivates you, that really impresses you. And you can provide your legal services in accordance with what you think is really right. Yes, exactly. And we'll get on to your board role because I really want to talk about that. And we're going to go into your business and speak about that. I think just on that point that you're talking about, you can control anything as a solo. Sometimes mm -hmm. a conflict can come up even as a solo. Even but if. often the volume of the business, the monetary volume is not enough to create a massive conflict. And so mm -hmm. even if you may be doing some work, for example, in your firm for a client that is a client of the board that you're about to join, that's probably not going to be over the threshold 
of revenue to make it a pure conflict and so exactly. often you can get over that challenge well let's go into this exciting area because you did set up your own law firm and i think that was about six months ago exactly last july wow <laughs> wow okay so tell us about that process i know for being somebody who's moved to set up my own business from the corporate world that it takes a lot of confidence and it takes a lot of risk taking aspiration as well both in equal measure perhaps so tell me about your story to get to opening up your firm well it take a lot of confidence for me um, to set up my own um, law firm. I had to, you know, first make an image of what clients I can serve for even after I leave Deloitte. Um, I also had to think about what kind of legal text I have to implement for my law firm. I didn't have a concrete image of the revenues that I can gain. Um, in the first and the second and three years, I had to prepare my own business plans, and that take a lot of time. Um, there were a lot of mental stress, of course, but finally, I just make it through. Uh, yeah, you take the jump. Yes. <laughs> you sort of don't know everything, and that's the whole point, is that you can never know everything before you start. And sometimes exactly. you just have to really start on the way and work it out as you go you can get the key foundations in there you know that they're going to be some clients who are going to come to you mm -hmm. um the stress will probably always be there yes uh, revenues well always the first two years of any business is mm -hmm. very tough so you kind of have to have some savings as well and not be just out there like a startup just going yes. by the this the sniff of an oily rag as they sometimes say you've really got to have some gasoline in the tank right yes and yes I yeah. think the important thing that you should know that you can never be perfect in everything you can never guess everything that will happen in the future so there are times that you have to just dive in yeah so did you have any help with people you may be guiding you in that way or do you somehow come to that realization yourself that okay I know I've got enough and that it's time to go out I can do it. What leads you to that positive mindset? Well, um, it's, it happens always in my life. I think this is just my habit. I just did it alone. I didn't really ask many people around me um, how solo would be like, because I believe that every solo entrepreneur have their own plans or own um, life path that they have done to become solo. So I just did it by myself. And I know that in my instinct, I just know that I will make success by being a solo entrepreneur. So it take a lot of confidence, but I was not worried so much to be distressed or something like that. Yeah, it's your instinct. You just know and you have to back yourself. And mm -hmm. what's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work. You can say on your career, tried my law firm gave it a, a year or two, decided to go back and do something else, right? So Exactly, exactly. Right? What's the worst that can possibly happen? And I think this is the approach to anything at all. Nothing is going to happen that is so devastating that you can't do something else. Exactly. For me, even at the worst scenario, I, I just can't go back to Deloitte because I, I didn't make any you know quarrels with, the, with Deloitte when leaving. We still have a good relationship. So even my solo practice didn't work. I just can't say to Deloitte that, can I just go back to Deloitte? There are clients that I would like to serve. And I believe that Deloitte will say, okay, they will, they will accept me when I go exactly. back. Exactly. Yeah. This whole point of not burning any bridges, this community is far too small. So you yes, had a, you had a backstop. Important. You had a backstop. And then also, you know, they would welcome you back because you've gone and done another experience. You've you've established a company, a mm -hmm. business, and if it didn't work, you can still come back and bring that experience to the mm -hmm. advice that you would give to their clients. There's nothing yes. wrong. Yes, ex <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, yes, Catherine, you made a really good point because, you know, people will be distressed if they think that this is the only path they can take. No, it's not because you, you can see all around you and there, there are ways to go through and there are ways that you can just choose 
when the one path you're choosing right now doesn't work well. Yeah, exactly. And so what did you find then going out on your own? What were the first things that sort of surprised you that you thought were oh, quite easy and others were surprisingly a bit more difficult to do? I didn't expect that my solo practice would be very easy. But at the same time, in the reality, I thought that things are moving quite better than I had expected. Now, the first thing that is that a tax partner in Deloitte um, has introduced you to me and, you know, to and recommend that I should connect with you because you will probably help me in some way. And well, you, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe by this, we are helping each other as a first, a first stage. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. No, not at all. You know, no. and this is my passion, obviously, as you can tell, anybody listening to this now knows that it's my passion to get anybody into doing solo practice and live their life. And so I'm very happy that you are doing this and that someone would introduce you to me so that I can help you in some way. So that's great to hear. Thank you. And maybe there, there will time, time will come that I can help you in some kind of way. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. Great. So what's happened then? I mean, you've how did you find your first clients? Well, actually, <laughs> my first client came from my friend. Right. Um, and the second client came from my family. Right. So, <laughs> Yay, to family and friends. Okay. Yes, family and friends. Always the family and friends that will help me, to help you. Yes. And what happened from there? When did your first sort of non, maybe family or friend uh, client came come along? Or maybe... Maybe that's not actually a very good question because if I think about my practice, it's often through friends and network mm -hmm. or contacts. Yes. So tell me a bit more about that. I won't presume to tell you or to answer <laughs> your question. Go ahead. It's surprising to know that all the law firms I have worked for in my past career have introduced me some kind of clients. Isn't that surprising? No, it's not. <laughs> Maybe it is to listeners, but I will tell you that one of my first really lovely jobs was from a very huge law firm in Tokyo. They gave the work to me because it was too small for them, but it wasn't too small for a solo. And I am forever indebted to them for doing that and the partner who did that. I so can yes, imagine. Yes, right. I can mm. now imagine that. Mm. They will give us clients. Maybe the reason is because of their conflicts of interest. Maybe, as you mentioned, the reason is the size of the project yep. Yep. or maybe just the resource, but they will, you know, introduce us clients. So I really think it's important to never burn up any connections, any relationships in your past careers or in your past path. Yes, they will just come back to you and help you in a very lovely way. You are totally right. I remember uh, having to get some letters of reference for mm -hmm. applying for my Gaiben, right, the foreign lawyer registration. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to previous employers oh, to yes. ask for those letters. So if you've burnt your bridges, it's not going to be easy to get those kinds of letters. So you are so right. I was going to ask you the next question, the most important thing that you've learned from your career in law and, you know, your businesses so far, what would that be? But maybe one of those things is never burn the connections, never burn your bridges. But is there something else that you that's coming up for you that's one of the most important things you've learned in your career so far? The most important thing I have learned from my career so far is have courage. You always have to encourage yourself in overcoming the challenge to maybe just take the bar, maybe diving into the practice you never know. You know, everyone wants to be regarded as kind, warm, you know, amicable to everyone else surrounding you. But there are situations that you just have to stand for yourself and for others that are really suffering. And you know, doing the right thing sometimes require courage. And I believe that. So I really learned that from my career that having courage in myself can be a real strength to me and also will be a strength to your clients as well. Brilliant. And you said you had another thing you wanted to tell. Yeah. I really had a hard time in my younger age 
But so I would like to send my words to those who have are having a very hard time right now. I'll just say that it doesn't matter how strong you are right now. It doesn't matter. Also, it doesn't matter how smart you are or just how tough you can be. But the world will find a way to break you somehow. And when you are in the times like that, the only thing you can do is to just hold on. I love this quote. I, I don't know who said this, but this is a quote that I found in the website. But I think this is really true. You know, the only thing you can do is to just hold on, cling to your hopes and beliefs, and just withstand the situation. The time will come at the perfect timing, and just don't miss that. Wow, and that really ties into what you said first about having courage. Mm-hmm, exactly. And encouraging yourself. I mm-hmm. realize that the word encourage has the word courage in it. <laughs> exactly. Of course it does. <laughs> but obviously it encourage does. is to encourage yourself. But I, I really loved how you've just told us that the only thing you can do is cling to your beliefs and time will give you the yes. opportunity and just to be ready for that when it comes up. It will be okay. Yes. And in the younger age, I didn't recognize that, but just going into to the you know mid forties, then I now can tell others that things will happen at the perfect timing when you are prepared. So I think that the quote that I've found in the website is really, really true. Mm, and perfect can often be when that opportunity and preparation come together. Exactly. Okay, so speaking of opportunity and preparation, tell me about this board role. You're a supervisory board member at a company mm-hmm. here. Are you able to tell us the company name? Oh, it's Marilyn Corporation, a logistics company. A logistics company. Yes. That sounds exciting. Tell us about what it's like. I really love the management role. Once you take the position, you will witness you know, how highly connected the world or the company is, you know, any action or any decision you make as a management can affect the entire activity or entire status of the company. You know, you might have a butterfly effect on anywhere you you wouldn't have even imagined. So as a management, you should predict as much as possible, explain in words to the employees or demonstrate in front of them that what the management is seeing in the future and what kind of business or the what kind of success they're aiming at. So the employees will be very motivated to work for the company. And yes. I think, yes, this kind of leadership role, shall I say, is really, really inspiring for me. I'm really enjoying the kind of role. Yeah, and it, it has to be not lofty and out there. Exactly. It has to be explaining that vision, but how it connects how it really connects to their daily work. And I think that's the key that I've found from these kinds of roles is it's great to expound and say visions and this is what we're going to do. But, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm sitting over here in this department. What does that mean to me on my work schedule? How do I help the company fulfill its vision, right? You have to break it down to the daily work that the employees are doing, right? Right. And that's where the managers down the line become Mm -hmm. very, very important. So what important lessons then are you bringing to this role from your law experience, both as the employee that you were before and now as this entrepreneur running a law business? Well, it's mostly uh, my role is to provide the legal advice to the management of the company to prevent them from future or possible disputes, disputes. by, you know, maybe just by by signing that agreement or just joining into the project there they would like to. Most advice is a legal advice. Right. So it's sort of advice that's given from your experience rather than as a lawyer providing legal advice like the legal department would do. It's a little bit different as a more high level of this kind of thing could happen if you take that approach or from my experience, you know, this is the sort of thing that you might want to avoid that could come up, that kind of advice. Yes, by joining the management of a company, you can see the real business, what's going on in the daily life. You can just visit the factories, 
um, in the countryside. You can go directly into the back office that the people are working. You can just talk to the employees directly or the business managers directly what the problem is. That's so true, though, because yes, exactly. when you're yes. in, say, a lawyer in a legal department or in a law firm, you can't do that. You can't go walk exactly, into a building exactly. or you can't talk directly to people in a different area mm-hmm. and you're not able to really readily visit, as you say, the plants or factories and see the real business. It's completely different when you're at a board level. What makes someone a really good fit, do you think, for a board role in general and maybe for this particular role that you've got, which is – in the supervisory board, what do you kind of need to have to bring to the board to make yourself a really good advisor for them? I think understanding the company very well. You have to be familiar with the business, of course. You have to be familiar to the industry standard they are trying to follow. And so to do that, it is essential to visit the offices even they are in the countryside, you have to talk to the employees or the business leaders directly, exchange opinions, listen to what they think the issues are, listen to why the revenues are not going well. And of course, you, you should um, attend meetings um, regarding the management and, of, and also the business meetings as much as possible. That's right. Yeah. And is there something quite different, though, I think, between being an outside director on a board and having the role that you've got, which is the supervisory Mm -hmm. board member? It's a little bit different, right? Because you're uh, like a statutory auditor. Yeah. So it's a little bit different, I think, to the director or outside director. And for me personally, I think that this kind of role really gives you a broader understanding of the company, even more holistically than an outside director. What do you think? I agree with you. The lawyers cannot be an internal officer. We are always the external director or the supervisory. But when you ask questions about the business, because to make a decision whether this is legally um, okay or not, you must have the right information, accurate information sufficiently So um, you have to have a broad picture of the um, business and that's where the business people come in to explain you the the knowledge and the generals of the um, business they are making. Yeah, and I think too that you're right, directors and the audit team on board. So the board of directors and the supervisory board, they work together, right? They link together. Exactly. And they're like a yin and yang, right? Black and white or white and black. Exactly. And they help each other to make sure that the company is getting to the right decision, having covered out all those things. And I think when you think of the supervisory board, you're sort of helping the directors to make sure that they've covered to make all sure, that, yes, exactly. Yeah, they've covered all those questions and they haven't left anything out. And it's it's not so much analyzing them or directing them or being, you know, auditing them to make sure that they are doing the right job. Although technically that's what it is, yes, but practically speaking, it's a very kind connection between both of them and very diplomatic again to make sure that we are as a team helping each other. Exactly. How do you go about finding this kind of role in a company as a board member? Because in this corporate world, searches are often kind of held a little bit quietly, aren't they? Like sometimes people refer to them as whisper networks. They're not listed on LinkedIn. They're not on job websites, but rather it's sort of, I think, held in the network that you have. The network could include, you know, recruiters or other people who might suggest you to a board. How about you and how did you go about finding the role in this particular company? Totally the same, as you mentioned, Catherine. Actually, a friend of mine have introduced this first role to me because she was a former employee of the president. So the president directly contacted my friend to become a supervisor audit member of the board. And she yeah. mentioned that, well, she's not a corporate lawyer, so I, I can introduce uh, my friend to you. And that was me. So it's, I think... Most of the um, offer come from that kind of introduction. That's right. And so you're always basically interviewing wherever you are (laughs) in this community and wherever you are, whatever you are doing, people are observing you. When you're in the middle of your network, you are really advertising 
and interviewing yourself before it's even happened because people are going to only introduce you if they think you'd be a good fit because mm -hmm. they've got to know you from your network. Exactly. So exactly. excellent. Wow. Is there some piece of advice that you would give to people, women or lawyers or anybody really who's looking for a board role? What would that be? I mean, mine would be that exactly committing to and cultivating a really broad network. Is there anything else that you would suggest as advice for those who are looking for these board roles? Yes. Yes. Catherine, I think that you once mentioned that maybe you should, um, you know, set up a network like that to, for, you know, for the young people to just join and to receive offers from the um, companies regarding this kind of role. But the essential is to just broaden your network. That is it. Because I know that I'm going to be nominated for another similar role by two listed companies this year. And those offers also come from my friend network and they introduced me to be one. So Wow. There you go. Yes. Congratulations on the nominations. Well, it's, all, it's only a nomination. <laughs> no, but that's exactly right. But to be nominated is, is, is an excellent thing. So well done. So, yes, yeah. so you, we have to be careful before we open our mouth. Absolutely. Mouths because, Absolutely. Yes. And a nomination is a nomination. That's simply yes, all exactly. it is, right? Well, let's just move then into the last few questions. I want to ask you about advice for young lawyers and also on the future of law. But first up, young lawyers. Can you remember some of the advice that you got when you were first starting out? And maybe some was good and some wasn't so good, but the advice that you would offer up for young lawyers who are listening to this and are thinking about, mm, eventually I'd like to do my own practice, but what should I think about as my first few things when I'm starting out in the law? Well, you should focus on the issue or the project that you are facing right now. So. You shouldn't fear about your lack of knowledge. If there is a time you, you fear those kind of things, just focus on how to fill in those kind of lack of information or knowledge. Great advice. Is there anything particular to having a legal career in Japan that we should be careful about that young people might want to think about for a law career in Japan? It's always my advice to think that you know, the lawyer is not only it's not the only career that you should consider of. Well, you don't have to discard the, uh, the the career, but like the positions as an outside director or the member of the supervisor and auditor management, um, there are ways that you can um, live your own life with another color than the lawyer itself. So be open to new ideas and just be open to new friendships, new connections. So that would give you a hint of what you would be like to be in your, mm. in your future. Fantastic. Wow. That, that's such great advice. Be open to other possibilities, other colors. I love how you said that. Um, what about then the future of law? Because if we're all moving ahead, there are kind of different ideas or thoughts that you might have about the law in your own field that you're doing every day, or maybe in general in the legal market in Japan in the next three, four, five years? What do you see happening? In Japan in particular, the globalization is not stopping. So I really think that the linguistic capabilities are going to be a must for most Japanese companies. The business market of Japan is shrinking, to be honest, because, you know, actually the population is shrinking, declining. So they are seeing the business market globally, which means that they have to know the laws and rules in the overseas countries. And also inside the Japanese market, I believe that many Japanese companies are going to seek for foreign employees to supplement the lack of resources in Japan. Yeah, I think so yes, too. That's one thing. I agree. I think some funny thing happened when I first arrived in Japan. They were not so keen on Japanese language. It didn't really mm -hmm. matter. It was a nice to have. And then swiftly, it's moved to being really important. And I think what you're saying is both Japanese for working in Japan, but also English 
to be very global is also going to be necessary, that linguistic capability. Well, excellent. Let's finish up on a lighter note uh, with some other questions here. So you mentioned one saying that you've looked on the internet about before, but do you have a favorite saying or something, a kotowaza, you know, an expression that you have maybe in English or Japanese that you often talk about or you refer to? I can say two quotes that I love. One is from the Gandhi, uh, the Indian leader. It's that your belief become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. So we always have to first think what our belief or what our thought is very carefully. Whoa, that's such a good one. Yeah, what's your your (laughs) other one? You got another one? Yes, it's a quote from a writer. And I'm sorry that I can't give you the exact name, but I love the quote that courage does not mean roaring, not always. Sometimes courage is just the quiet voice at the end of the day that says, well, I will try again tomorrow. Oh, it's a lovely quote. I love it. Oh, good, isn't it? It just gives so much ease. I love that because you can roar when you need to. And standing Mm -hmm. up, as you said, standing up for others uh, is really important at times. But sometimes actually being quiet and observant and listening and waiting is okay as well as courage yes, okay. for the next day just, <gasps> yes it's just the next day just give they it are then. brilliant wow what's something about you that a lot of people don't know i think um not many people know about me that i love mountaineering going outside for hiking or travel rural places i believe that um not many people know that i just love the great nature. Great outdoors. Wonderful. If you could choose an activity to do in your free time, would it be mountaineering? Exactly. What's one thing that you are really looking forward to this year? Oh, wow. I was waiting for that question, Catherine. I know. Um, (laughs) I'm going to have a dog finally. I'm a huge dog lover. Yay. Tell yeah. us about your dog. Yes, it's going to be a kai inu. It, inu means dog. And so kai is the ancient way in saying Yamanashi Prefecture. It's the kai. So it's a dog from the kai area. It's an old Japanese dog species. Uh, many people know the Akita inu, the dog from the Akita Prefecture. It's similar, but it's smaller than Akita inu, but love mountains, love hiking so i know that it will be a very good friend for me when i go outside for hikings and mountaineerings wow when are you getting this dog i already contacted um the breeder mm. and i i picked up some um, some breeders and going to say hello to the father and mother dog <laughs> uh, in in march that's so sweet. And have you thought yes. of a name for it? Or are you going to just leave that as a secret for later? I have a couple of lists of the names, but um, I'm mm. just, I, I haven't made up my mind yet. Depends when you see him or her, what you think. Wow. Exactly. One name is going to be Daifuku. It means great happiness in Japanese. That's great. You'd be yelling at Daifuku. Daifuku. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then that's good luck coming to you every time you say that. That's exactly. Fantastic. So excited to hear that. Well, Kaori, thank you so much for thank coming you, on the show. I We've had so much fun. I've really enjoyed this. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. And it was my pleasure, today. Catherine. Thank you so much. And for listeners who are interested in connecting with you, where's the best place to do that? Is that on your website or LinkedIn? What should we do? I think LinkedIn will be the best um, way to contact me because it's the common field that you and I are working on. That's exactly right. We'll put that Mm -hmm. in the show notes. And for everyone who is listening, and if you really enjoyed this, please do reach out to Kaori. Please let us know that you loved this episode by giving it a rating and a like on Apple Podcasts or whichever 
podcast player you are listening to and go ahead and share it with someone who might be thinking how to be courageous, how to get out there and do their own business and how to get on a board. Uh, we hope you've really enjoyed it today. That's all for now. Cheers, come pie and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. Please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I invite you to connect with me to talk more. Jump on over to LinkedIn or Instagram where you can find me or send me a message via my website contact page. That's all from me today. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer on Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.